Greetings and welcome to another lively edition of The Deadly Experiment, ladies and gentlemen. That's me, Rick Adams, on camera, your producer and host. We're back again today on this program. This is like a follow-up to the program we did on Hollywood child abuse and, of course, um, the raping and the molesting and the seducing of many of the actresses in Hollywood uh, by the Weinsteins and, of course, by a number of others, uh, which went unreported but well known within the industry. We are now watching this whole industry come under attack and despite the reasons and despite who's behind it and what they seek to gain from it, the shekel changing, the ownership changes, the dog eat dog, you know, the money grubbing, it matters not. God is on his throne, folks. He is watching and he is having the time of his life, to put it that way. Because God says in his word that God is not mocked. He shall not be mocked. Whatever a nation, a man, a people sow that also shall they reap. America today is reaping disaster because it has sown disaster. All over the world, here at home, the Roman Empire, Holy Roman Empire, excuse me, is now rotting from within very quickly, and we are on our last leg, folks. We are diminishing and we are devolving quickly to the point of judgment. Right out of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, where he tells us the blessings and the curses. Now, we're going to get into some of those curses today and how God has allowed the truth to come out, even with the curses. Ted Gunderson is going to be featured speaking for a 10-minute segment. Ted Gunderson, I know personally. He is a former FBI supervisor for 27 years in the Los Angeles offices of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He resigned. He left. He retired, actually, quite lawfully. But when he retired, he began to be fascinated with these strange cases of kidnapping of children, little children, the Johnny Garsh case, for instance, in Des Moines, Iowa, and how this was opening his eyes to a much greater ring of sex child sex slavery, of this industry of drugs, and this industry of snuff films, and the kidnapping and murder of young children by elements within the CIA itself, the intel community, and the FBI. Did you hear what I just said? Well, you'd better, because it's all too true, documented that the CIA is an evil organization, not to protect America, but to build the one world beast system of the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. We're going to also see the story of Andrew Breitbart from Breitbart News, how he died mysteriously when he was looking into the sex slave industry. And we know what happened with Pizzagate being revealed through WikiLeaks, how the Democratic bigwigs were involved in this child sex slavery ring. It's all too real, my folks, my friends, Republicans as well, not exclusively Democrats. This is principalities and powers right out of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul. Wickedness from above. And what they're doing to children, God is taking note of, folks. He is watching them, and he is writing down the book and the ledger. And judgment will come for them unless they repent. Okay, so we're going to read, and we're going to see, actually, in this second video, Breitbart News, how he died mysteriously, and then the doctor performing the autopsy died mysteriously. Heart attacks don't just happen like this. And then Ted Gunderson himself finally succumbing. All right, let's go right to our video presentations right now and a word of closing at the very end. Serious business, folks. Pray and read your word of God. The great CIA is not only involved in adopt, I mean, kidnapping children, they're the biggest drug dealer in the world. As we know, Iran-Contra. And the CIA is the most evil organization that's ever been established in the history of the world. And the FBI is right along behind them. The FBI is involved too. I'm going to document information on the screen now about the finders. I have been to the FBI a half a dozen times and filed a formal complaint and they have yet to interview me. 
or to even contact me. Okay? And um, let's start. Oops. Let's talk about, before I go into the finders, let me just throw a few things up here about, you know, this is the finder. Reader's Digest, July 1982, 100,000 children are, miss, are missing every year. We're not talking about runaway teenagers, we're talking about kids that are two, three, four years old. They just disappear off the street. The great FBI will tell you how many bank robberies occurred last year, how many uh, uh, statutory rapes occurred. They'll tell you about armed robberies and ca uh, stolen cars. They won't give you figures on the missing children. Here's the finders. That's the great seal of the great CIA. This is your documentation. This has been given to the FBI by me personally. The top says uh, Department of the Treasury, U.S. Customs. This is a case that broke in 1987. And at that time, there was a, two well-dressed men in a van, Dodge van, that uh, were with six children, ages, as you see down here, two to six and seven years of age. They were in a park. The kids were shabbily dressed. The men were very well-dressed. The men had passports on them. The police went out and talked to them, and the children said that they were en route to Mexico to a smart school. Uh, the men refused to talk. The information was, the van had Virginia license plates on it, and the information was sent back to the Washington Metropolitan Police Department, Washington, D.C., and the files were checked there, and they learned that there had been information there about blood rituals that had taken place, and possibly a homicide. And uh, by the way, the Metropolitan Police Department obtained a search warrant, and that's where they came up with this information. Uh, there was a much more detail on it than what I'm giving you, but this is the report itself. And if you'll notice down here at the bottom, inspection of the premises revealed that organizations in different places in the world were involved in this project. And you see here, it says, London, Germany, the Bahamas, Japan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Africa, Costa Rica, Europe, and so forth. And there was a Palestinian aspect to it. And here's this kind of interesting. There was one a code word called uh, Operation Pentagon or Break-In Pentagon. Is, is it on there? I don't see it right now. Yeah. It was a code word. Yeah, okay, here it is. The Pentagon Break-In. Obviously a code word. So what happened? The customs agent uh, who investigated this was in contact with the Metropolitan Police Department. He went over there for a briefing to the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C. On April the 2nd, and uh, he was, had been working with the detective Bradley, uh, and at that time he was referred to a third person, probably somebody didn't want his name in his report, and he was advised that all the passport data had been turned over to the State Department for their investigation. The State Department in turn advised the Metropolitan Police Department that travel and use of the passports by the holders of the passports was within the law and no action would be taken. This includes travel to Moscow, uh, North Korea, and North Vietnam in the late 1950s and the mid-1970s. Well, it was illegal to travel in those countries in those days. The individual further advised of circumstances which indicated that the investigation into the activities of the finders had become a CIA internal matter. The Metropolitan Police Department report had been classified secret and was not available for results. I was advised that the FBI had withdrawn from the investigation several weeks prior and that the FBI Foreign Counterintelligence Division, that's Division 5 in headquarters, which handles all counterintelligence and counterespionage and so forth, 
uh, informed uh, the uh, Metropolitan Police and Customs uh, that they should not furnish the information to the Washington Field Office, which is the investigative uh, arm of the FBI in that area, not headquarters. No further information will be available, no further action will be taken. That's the finders. That ties into the Nebraska case. John DeCamp has made the statement publicly that the one organization that did more than anybody else to cover up the kidnapping ring, the case in Nebraska, the pedophile ring, the homosexual ring, was the FBI. John DeCamp, who is the attorney on record for these kids, two of these kids, has publicly stated, and it's in his book, the, the Franklin cover-up, it's in, on the back back there. If you don't have it, I highly recommend it, along with this video. Johnny Camp has stated that the one organization that did more to cover up the Nebraska Franklin cover-up situation, cover-up case itself, was the FBI. Um, here's some uh, headlines out of the Washington Times. You don't see this in the LA Times or the New York Times, by the way. This is June the 30th, 1989. Power broker served drug sex at parties, bug for blackmail. Craig Spence, who's identified, I think, in this article, and one, of, if not this one, the one I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Um, was with the CIA and his job, along with some other nefarious individuals, was to set up the congressmen, senators, uh, dignitaries uh, for blackmail. There was uh, one FBI agent in Omaha and another one in Chicago, a team of five, who traveled around the country and did some of their dirty works. The, there was a restaurant in New York City that was bugged, video and audio, specifically for the purpose of setting up congressmen, dignitaries, senators, etc. Homosexual prostitution probe and snarls officials of Bush and Reagan. Paul Benassi has drawn, drawn the living quarters of the inside of the White House. The public is not allowed in that portion of the building. I've been in the White House, but never there. In fact, matter of fact, I met that great American Henry Kissinger in the White House. <laughs> and not only that, I met Nancy. <laughs> and at the time, I didn't know. Uh, that's kind of an interesting case. I, I'm writing three books now, so I'll, you can read that in my book. But um, Some tapes uh, disappeared out of the FBI. Uh, headquarters, transcriptions of some illegal wiretaps is what they were. And uh, I was an inspector at the time and uh, was ordered along with three other inspectors and our aides to locate those tapes and they were finally located in the White House and uh, they'd been given to the White House and I waited all day for them and uh, finally my boss says go over there and wait over there, don't wait here, I'm getting tired of looking at your face. So I went over there one night late at the White House, went in and uh, found the tapes, talked to uh, Alexander Haig. And as a matter of fact, when I finally had an opportunity to talk to General Haig, I read his rights to him. I'm probably the only person in the history of the country to read the rights to, to, to Haig. <laughs> because he was a suspect, but we had, stuff, we had files missing, right? So he's a suspect. So I gave him his Miranda rights. And then I talked to him at length, and he said, yeah, I have the tapes here. He says, uh, they're being copied. He didn't say they're being copied. He said, I have the tapes here. And um, so-and-so uh, over at the headquarters uh, is coming over to pick him up tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Would you like me to give them to you or wait and give them to him? Well, the guy that was coming over the next morning at 9 o'clock outranked me, so what would you have done, right? Give them to the man that's coming over tomorrow at 9 o'clock, which I did. I left. Top Japanese politician linked to Spence, Craig Spence again, ex-CIA. Once he was exposed, uh, he was Arkansas'd. I mean, you know what that is. He committed suicide. 
six months after his exposure. Questions are being raised about some sharp remarks that conservative journalist Andrew Breitbart made to Clinton insider John Podesta some years ago. Many speculate that Breitbart knew what Podesta was hiding in his closet, so to speak. Did Andrew Breitbart know details about the child sex trafficking ring that is operating in Washington, D.C.? And did he know any details that connected John Podesta to it? Here is one video clip of Breitbart using some strong words for John Podesta. This is a concerted effort. This is a concerted effort. Politics of personal destruction. Fuck you, John Podesta. Whatever the hell they're doing. What's in your closet, John Podesta? <laughs> big Podesta? Big Soros? Do you want us to play these games? Because we're playing to win. Obviously, Breitbart was involved in some kind of war with John Podesta. Strangely enough, not long after this, Andrew Breitbart died suddenly of a heart attack. He was only 43 years old. Naturally, there was speculation as to whether or not Breitbart was murdered. But what could be done to trigger a heart attack? It is known that arsenic poisoning has been used by spies and intelligence agents to cause heart attacks that otherwise appear to be natural events. We would therefore have to ask if there was any evidence of arsenic poisoning in Breitbart's case. Clearly, an autopsy was needed. What happened next will shock you. The autopsy was conducted by 61-year-old Michael Cormier. On the day that his preliminary autopsy was to be released, Cormier himself died suddenly and unexpectedly. The cause of his death? Arsenic poisoning. So was Breitbart poisoned with arsenic as well? Or was some other substance used to trigger the heart attack? We can't be certain. But this would not have been the first time that a high-profile figure investigating the Illuminati's pedophile ring was killed through arsenic poisoning. The scandal that people today refer to as Pizzagate is really just a footnote in a much larger sex trafficking conspiracy, one that I've been reporting on for a long time. Some of the greatest investigative work into the trafficking network was conducted by FBI Chief Ted Gunderson. As head of the FBI field offices in Memphis, Dallas, and Los Angeles, he busted open the illegal pedophile trafficking ring and worked with victims of the CIA's MK Ultra program who had been imprisoned in the hellish child sex network operated by the Illuminati. He was an outspoken critic of the Illuminati and worked to expose their network, including the system they were operating inside Washington, D.C. Even after his retirement, Gunderson continued to investigate and attempt to expose the work of the New World Order. He was also vocal about his belief that elements within our own government coordinated the September 11th attacks, so it shouldn't necessarily come as a surprise that Gunderson was murdered. While we can only speculate that it was arsenic that led to a heart attack in Breitbart's case, we can say with certainty that it was arsenic that led to the development of bladder cancer in Gunderson's case, which is ultimately what killed him. He knew that it was arsenic that was causing the cancer, and he tried to negate its effects with his doctor's help. But Gunderson remained certain that one way or another, the Illuminati was going to kill him eventually through means that appeared to be natural causes. I reported on this about a year ago. Here's an excerpt from that report, along with a reference I made back then to the arsenic poisoning of Andrew Breitbart. Gunderson knew that he would be killed, and he asked for his family to have an autopsy done after his death to determine the true cause of his death. His family, friends, and even his personal doctor all testify that CIA operatives working for the Illuminati are most likely responsible for the ongoing arsenic poisoning that led to Gunderson's death. Shortly after uh, death, uh, within a matter of a couple of hours, uh, he started to turn black, uh, particularly in his face, his hands, and his feet. And this is a characteristic uh, sign of uh, arsenic poisoning. 
Uh, was this due to his attack upon the American Illuminati? Yes, very definitely, and uh, also his attack upon the CIA, which is being controlled by the Illuminati. And so you know, the murder of political activists with arsenic is not unheard of. After 43-year-old conservative Andrew Breitbart fell over dead when his heart mysteriously stopped one day, a much-anticipated coroner's report was due to be released. That report was never published because the coroner who worked on Breitbart died a sudden death from arsenic poisoning. These are very evil and very dangerous people that we are dealing with. Well, ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages, I'm sorry some of you children have had to see this, but for your own good, what the government of the United States has done, no, I'm not saying all of the agents of the FBI are corrupt. All of them create and uh, enlist these false flag attacks. They set up Muslims, they set up Americans who may be patriots, lone wolf type, for some sort of nefarious activity, and then create a fake attack, false flag attack as we have been seeing all along and we're going to see a lot more of them come we were telling you about this years ago no I don't say all of the FBI agents are bad I was working for the FBI for a very short time during my college years and I know that there were some very good agents in the FBI in fact the head of the local office his name was Tom Lardner at the time a very good strong Catholic his wife was in the pro-life movement and there were other agents as well Davis and Parker and so forth. I, I won't name all their names. They're all retired now. That was the FBI in the 1970s, 72, 73. This is following Watergate and the very strange death of J. Edgar Hoover. Folks, this gets real deep. We're dealing with a sub Rosa government that exists beneath the surface of the government that you see. There is a sex ring, there is a drug ring, there is a mafia, and in our word of God, all of it goes to the city of Jerusalem in the very end of this generation. Why? The city of Jerusalem, that is the rulers of that city, not all of the people, because there are good figs as well as bad figs, as Jeremiah 24 tells us. But it's the rulers of that city, the sons of Cain, who murdered Jesus Christ, who murdered most of the prophets and the apostles. They have the blood of Christ and them and the whole world. All the blood, as it says in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, falls upon their hands. It's not the Vatican. No, I'm sorry to tell some of you, it's not the Roman Catholic Church. Because this predates the Church and the Roman Empire and Greece by thousands of years, going back to 5,000 years ago. You can start in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15 onward, and read that Satan begot a child, and that child, of course, was Cain. He had sex with Eve and with Adam. Yes, it was a very perverted thing. God told them not to eat the fruit of the tree, but they did. And that fruit, of course, was the genitalia. They actually had intercourse to produce the child Cain. And Cain murdered his brother Abel. His seed line was an interwoven seed line when Cain was cast out east out of the garden, into the land of Nod. It says so right in your Bible. You could say it's Manchuria. You can say it's North Korea today. In any event, Cain, China, Chinese, all interrelate intertribally, and they are not the seed of Abraham. So what's this business about anti-Semitism when, in fact, these people are not even Shemites? It's not Sem, but Shem. They are not of the Caucasian Israelite race. They are of the demon seed race spoken of in the book of Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Are they not doing evil, kidnapping children, murdering children, disappearing children? to the tune of thousands of them now, thousands. Many of them have not ever been found again, put in snuff films, used, having sexual intercourse, and then killed. Friends, this is your government at work. Let me tell you something. And I am not fearful of saying that to the FBI or the CIA, because God knows your works, and he will judge your soul. The books are opened at the very end. So beware of that. There was a man known as 
Edgar Steele. I befriended him, too, as I did with Ted Gunderson. Honorable men. One day, the FBI set him up. He was in Idaho. He was a lawyer and a very brilliant man. He, both, he wrote the book Defensive Racism. He was a brilliant man. One day, the FBI set him up and actually had a workman who was working in his house plant a bomb under his wife's car. And then that bomb was under her car with her mother in it so that he eventually was charged with attempting to murder his wife and her mother, which was totally, completely false and nonsensical. But an FBI agent in Idaho actually planted the evidence and actually went before a judge who was corrupt, just like the judge in the Boston Marathon bombing hoax, Judge O'Toole, was totally corrupt. This was a show trial. You don't believe it? You just saw it. Your government is corrupt, and that's why it wants the guns, folks. Don't let them have them. But most of all, have this, the sword of the Lord, the word of God. We're just about out of time, folks. We're going to wrap up today, hoping that some of you may come forth and seek the truth, seek the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and have your sins wiped clean in that slate. Because if you don't, and you don't come forward, by the time the books open up in the book of Revelation, when all those sins come right to the front that you can't hide anymore, and you don't confess them and ask God to forgive you, then you go into the lake of fire. It's over. It's finito. It's done. No more. Utter darkness is what Jesus himself said. To the Jewish scribes and Pharisees who were about to murder him, he says, how can ye escape what? The pangs of hell. How can you escape hell itself, death and destruction and the lake of fire? Ye fools, ye knaves, ye den of vipers. And you can't either. None of us can. We are accountable to God. And God will exact his justice. He's doing it to America now. He's doing it to the world. So thank you for watching. Goodbye. And Yahweh bless his elect.